you. And I believe that is all of our housekeeping. Kieran, is there anything else that I missed? Um, no, I think that's it. If you, um, yeah, we can jump to the next slide and we'll give a quick overview of, of kind of who's gonna be talking tonight and, um, and then we can just dive right in, I guess. Um, we're gonna start by hearing from Allison James, um, who has um, been so kind as to help make this webinar happen from the town of Superior. She's a disaster preparedness and recovery manager. Um, and then um, after that, and she's gonna be talking about kind of a, we're gonna kind of start on the smaller scale and, and move outward um, through the evening. So she's gonna be talking about more um, specific kind of local to superior management and mitigation topics related to fire. And then we'll move out um, to hear from Paul Ostroy, who's the fire management officer for the Mountain View Fire Department, um, talking about management and mitigation um, in that slightly um, larger scale context. And then we will hear from Mike Smith and Amber Ortega from the Forest Service. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, their kind of methods and approaches to managing the landscape specifically, mostly talking about prescribed fire and kind of how decisions are made around that and planning works for that. Um, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, and then we'll close out. Um, and as Kat mentioned, we will send out a follow-up email after, after the webinar to share any links or resources that come up um, during the course of the webinar tonight. So um, I guess with that, we'll just go ahead and get started and hear from Allison. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you today about living with fire. We'll cover some key topics that Superior has been working on together with partners like the ones here today, including items like the community wildfire protection plans, fuels treatments, and resident resources. The first topic we have here is the Boulder County Fire Shed Grasslands Working Group. This group shares their current projects with each other, discusses the latest research findings, and explores collaborative efforts to help bridge knowledge gaps and enhance the effectiveness of grassland management practices. This group is a true cross-jurisdictional collaboration. As we know, fires do not know municipal boundaries. Land managers in this group are conducting extensive research to integrate management practices that not only reduce wildfire risks to communities and critical infrastructure, but to also sustain the ecological function and resiliency of our grasslands. Addressing the existing knowledge gaps that limit effective grassland management is a key focus of the efforts in this group too. Local municipalities whose representatives played a role in the development of the grassland management in Boulder County story map are dedicated to tackling these challenges together through a whole of society approach. The story map can give you a broad overview of this group and the link is on this slide. The strategy involves partnerships across the various sectors and community engagement, like the recent Front Range Grasslands Wildfire Workshop, to ensure that many perspectives and broad expertise contributes to the sustainable solutions. Historically, scientists believe that grasslands experienced frequent and low severity fires, yet the science on what grasslands should look like is less definitive compared to the forest ecosystems right now. Specifically, there is a lot of uncertainty among scientists and land managers about which management strategies are the most effective in mitigating wildfire risk, while simultaneously supporting the natural ecology of these grasslands. This uncertainty requires a flexible and adaptive management approach while it's figured out. As new information comes to light from ongoing research, information gathering, collaborative workshops, and data from the implementation of management actions, our strategies can be adjusted to reflect the latest insights. This self-informing process ensures that land management practices will remain responsive to the dynamic and kind of complex nature of these grassland ecosystems. 
by maintaining that flexibility and having a lot of accountability, we can better safeguard both the ecological health of the grasslands and the safety of the surrounding communities. In a few minutes, I'll dive into some specific vegetative fuels reduction projects in Superior that aim to enhance wildfire resilience. And I'd like everyone to know that together, we're hoping that we can build a stronger, more resilient landscape that balances our wildfire risks reduction while keeping that ecological integrity intact in this area. And next slide. Next, I'd like to briefly discuss our community wildfire protection plans, commonly known because we all love our acronyms as CWPPs. These plans are important for enhancing community safety and resiliency against wildfires. A CWPP is a collaborative plan that addresses wildfire risk and outlines strategies to protect our communities. They involve a lot of people, including residents, emergency responders, local government officials, other stakeholders um, who are all working together to identify these risks and prioritize actions to mitigate them. The six general key components of a CWPP are the community profile, which talks about the community's history, the people, and the geography, the wildfire risk assessment, which analyzes wildfire risks by looking at fuel types, weather, and terrain. Wildfire protection goals, which lists the community's priorities for the wildfire protection. Action plans, which detail steps to achieve wildfire protection goals. The implementation strategy, which explains how the community will carry out this action plan and it includes resources and the partners needed for the actions. And then lastly, the evaluation and monitoring that outlines how the community will check in, in on and update the plan's effectiveness over time. The benefits of CWPPs are enhancing safety by addressing the wildfire risks, and their main goal is to help protect lives, property, and infrastructure. They also can increase funding opportunities because communities with CWPPs are many times more eligible for state and federal funding to support wildfire mitigation projects. Grants um, often mention if um, uh, an action item is in a CWPP, they're more likely to fund it. They also improve coordination um, amongst different agencies and stakeholders, which give a broader, more effective and coordinated wildfire management effort. So community wildfire protection plans are vital tools for enhancing our wildfire resilience. They bring together the communities and the stakeholders and create comprehensive strategies for reducing risks and improving emergency preparedness. By investing in CWPPs, we can build safer, more resilient communities capable of withstanding the growing threat of wildfires. In Boulder County, we have two CWPPs that um, we've worked on in on the core teams for in Superior. The first one is the Mountain View Fire CWPP, which was completed in December of 2023. And Boulder County CWPP, which is in the public comment stage and is projected to be complete in August of 2024. I encourage everyone on our invite list here who is a Boulder County resident to hop into that link, take a look and provide feedback on the Boulder County CWPP. It's very, very interesting and you can learn a lot about what land managers are working on um, in this area. Next slide, please. This next topic is a quick overview of our town-wide fuel treatment and facility hardening plan in Superior. 
Note that new areas are always being activated and added, but generally you could see here that the plan includes the majority of open spaces within superior municipal boundaries. This mitigation work is designed to reduce wildfire risks through various vegetative fuel management strategies and through the hardening of critical facilities. We worked on the identification of areas across town with vegetative fuels that needed to be managed with Mountain View Fire and Rescue over a year and a half ago, or maybe longer. This information is a critical tool in our wildfire mitigation efforts, guiding us in targeting specific areas. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates some of the strategies Superior is using for fuels reduction. Our townwide fuels treatment and facility hardening plan is a comprehensive approach to reducing wildfire risk in town. By utilizing diverse strategies such as goat grazing, weed management, tree limbing, and facility hardening, we aim to create a safer environment for our community. Just to get dig a little deeper on those topics, we use goat grazing, grazing as a natural and effective method to reduce vegetation and create defensible space around our community. Goats help control underbrush and reduce fuel loads and make it harder for wildfires to spread. This process leaves behind areas with reduced vegetation, which can be vulnerable to erosion, erosion and invasive species colonization. So after goat grazing as a part of vegetation management and that strategy, seeding with low grow firewise seed mixes can be an effective follow-up step to enhance wildfire resilience in the open spaces. This helps to restore vegetation in those areas while maintaining fire resistant landscapes. The seed mixes include native drought tolerant plants with low growing characteristics and the selected plant species in the firewide seed mixes are chosen for their ability to resist ignition and slow fire spread. And this contributes to our over overall wildfire resilience. The roots of these low grow plants help to stabilize the soil, reducing erosion risks in post grazing areas. Native plants in the seed mixes provide habitats and food resources for wildlife and contribute to biodiversity and conservation. Our Weed Ambassador Program, which is a volunteer group of residents in the community, focuses on helping to manage noxious weeds, which can be highly flammable. Ambassadors also help to spread the word and educate the community. We conduct tree limbing to remove lower branches, reducing the risk of ground fires spreading into the canopy. This creates a safer environment and helps to protect larger trees. It also helps to potentially reduce embers and firebrands, which are burning materials that can travel through the air during wildfires contributing to fire spread. Reducing vegetation along trails and fences also creates fire breaks, vital in slowing or stopping wildfire spread. Fire breaks not only aid firefighters in accessing the fire, but also help to contain the flames, reduce the risk of rapid spread to adjacent areas, and it does this by slowing down the fire's advance. Fire breaks may also give firefighters valuable time to strategize and deploy firefighting resources effectively, ultimately enhancing their ability to suppress the wildfire and protect lives and property. Not only are these fuel breaks along the fence lines and trails, but we also do them on main thoroughfares like McCaslin Boulevard. In addition to vegetative fuel treatments, we're working on hardening cr critical facilities. It involves making our buildings more resistant to fire through measures such as installing fire resistant materials and enhancing defensible space around structures to better withstand fire impacts. To ensure the effectiveness of our efforts, we are continuously collecting data on the successes of these vegetative mitigation strategies too. This data will inform our future rounds of mitigation, allowing us to continuously approve our approaches and adapt to changing conditions and then share them with others like the Grasslands Working Group. You can see an example of what this data is beginning to look like in this slide in the lower right photo. 
that photo illustrates how we're tracking species year over year on parcels that are grazed and then reseeded uh, for, you know, to see how the success is. Next slide, please. For my last slide, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of preparedness. Wildfires pose a significant threat to our communities, especially in wildfire prone areas. Understanding the risks involves recognizing the potential for wildfires and identifying vulnerable areas within the community. Another part is the situational awareness. Patterns, fuels, and historical fire data that can help in assessing and mitigating risks. Utilizing available resources is crucial for effective wildfire preparedness. The Town of Superior provides a dedicated webpage with important preparedness information. This resource offers information to stay informed with local alerts and advisories from Boulder County Office of Disaster Management and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration All Hazards Weather Radio. The website also has information around programs like this one, a video library of past programs you may access at any time, and other preparedness and resiliency topics to support the community. There are many preparedness topics, and we've partnered with many groups to give a well-rounded preparedness offering to everyone, and we're always open to suggestions. Just to name a few of our partners, again, Boulder, County Office of Disaster Management has been integral in our general preparedness, Mountain View Fire, the Red Cross, Jewish Family Services, Center for People with Disabilities, uh, the Veterinary Medical Reserve Corps, just to name a few. Speaking of supports, Wildfire Partners is now a key resource for residents in Eastern Boulder County, offering personalized assistance in wildfire mitigation efforts. Superior is working alongside Wildfire Partners in resident-led neighborhood assessments. This program provides these assessments, guidance, and financial incentives to help homeowners reduce wildfire risks on their property and in neighborhoods. By participating in the wildfire partner programs, resident, residents can take proactive steps and learn more to help protect their homes and properties and ensure they are better prepared for wildfire threats. Please explore these offerings on their website like the community mitigation services for the neighborhood assessments, their chipping programs, home mitigation checklists, and many more things. By working together and staying informed, we can all better protect our community from wildfires. So let's build a safer, more resilient future together. And on this note, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. That was great info. And again, we will um, share all of the links that she um, shared in her presentation out as well as a recording of um, this whole webinar and slides after in a in an email after um, to follow up with everyone. Um, and next we are going to hear from Paul Oxjoy, who is the fire management officer for the Mountain View Fire Department. So take it away, Paul. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening, everybody. And I kind of wanted to start off by saying I appreciate the opportunity to speak here at this webinar. And uh, moving forward with this presentation here, we're going to hit a little bit on uh, Mountain View itself, some of the um, things that we are attempting to uh, change, I guess, within the ability of the department. And since the um, the recent fires, or I guess, should we say the Marshall Fire, um, what have we done uh, since then to update our program and recognize the need for change? So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And... Oh, starting off with... Okay. Somewhere here. Okay, there we go. Uh, good evening, 2020. Uh, Mountain View merged with both 
uh, Rocky Mountain Fire and Mountain View. Uh, these combined programs um, were created to basically create a framework uh, for the future here within Boulder County. And while these two programs were well established, um, we also needed a little bit of time to fine tune it and enhance the capabilities of the, the merged district. And so with that, right, Mountain View merged with Rocky Mountain Fire. Rocky Mountain Fire ended up taking over, or the, we, um, within the district, we were in Superior. And now, so you'll see the Mountain View Fire more as the logo that shows up as your, um, as your resource that's coming for a rescue. So brief history here, um, Mountain View is an all hazard response program. And so we offer everything from EMS to tech rescue, high angle, and as well hazmat, which is hazardous material response, wildland response, and a SWAT response. We work together in collaboration with many agencies across the front range uh, to provide these, uh, I guess, avenues of um, ability. And so some of those are uh, Rocky Mountain Rescue and um, the Forest Service, along with um, the Boulder County Hazmat Program and other agencies here within the, the, uh, the county. So uh, we are basically, that we have 10 stations that house 211 total personnel. We are looking at hopefully providing two newer stations here shortly. Um, you'll see here that within our program, we cover over 250 square miles. Um, this includes 77,000 permanent residents and more than 60,000 daily commuters. Um, this show, this map here shows the area uh, for our response all the way from up in Flagstaff to El Dorado Springs, the city of Dakono, the town of Erie, town of Mead, community of Niwot, and the town of Superior. Um, as well as there are 25 other fire protection, well, 24 other fire protection districts within the county that also respond, not specifically to our district, while they are uh, a mutual aid resource. Um, they do have their uh, primary regions that they respond to, but um, we all help each other at, in the time of needs. So what I wanted to hit on here is that recently with kind of the change of the idea for the resources and or agencies that are those 25 that we discussed, um, we are looking at now a different plan for response. And so you'll see here within this side, a um, little bit of information here that this is what we get sent out daily. Uh, and this daily information comes across saying that whether it's a low, medium or high response, and we base those off of um, a couple of these indices that you'll see. And so the hot, dry, windy index. So that basically uh, determines their days that are more likely to have adverse atmospheric conditions, making it difficult to manage wildfire. And so it goes from a 0% to 75%, and 75% is on the high end, where um, right now we're scoring on a low of one um, to help us kind of create that response level. The ERCs, the energy release component, uh, this is a number related to the heat energy that's released per the square foot within the flaming front of a fire. So basically a good way to look at this is if the environment was to be compared to a charcoal grill, the ERC could be seen as the measure of how many briquettes are in the grill in front of that flame. Front. And so with what we saw the other day, our ERCs were low enough um, that we were able to score that as a one as well. The next one is our thousand hour fuels. And I'm sure the Forest Service will get into a little bit more of these in detail. Um, and so I'm, I'm only gonna hit on um, the understanding of why we use it, but uh, this is a measurement of a three to eight inch diameter log um, that 
basically they take much longer to dry out and absorb moisture. And so they're harder to ignite. And so if we have a scale within these thousand hour fuels that helps us uh, recognize where those uh, three to eight inch diameter fuels are very, very dry, then we can put that at a score um, that will rate it, whether it's low, medium or high again. And so the last couple of response levels that we've received have been low, thank goodness to the moisture that we've received over the last couple of days and continuous um, over this early portion of the year, should we say. The next slide we'll talk about here is the indices that more or less help provide those type of resources that we'll send. So those indices here that we talked about, the low, medium, and high, you'll see on the low end when we have a wildfire grass or wild wildland grass fire or a controlled burn that was out of control on a low indice day, we send one type one engine with a brush truck, a battalion chief, and a fire duty officer. And as the indices start to rise throughout the season, uh, you'll see that we increase the amount of resources that we provide to the incident uh, so that we're able to facilitate the, I guess, amount of resources needed uh, during that time frame to, uh, to to manage the incident, and so um, already providing these resources and the personnel uh, help enforce the the supervision there on fire to help request the uh, specific resources needed to minimize the the threat, should we say? So um, these are now very good schematics that we're using within the county to help. Um, provide a better level of service uh, to all of our constituents. So hopefully this um, provides a little bit of understanding when you see uh, a little bit more of a, res a response during a higher fire danger days than, than lower. Uh, one thing the county has as well uh, come up with is a county evacuation polygons. And so these are all more or less been given to all the firefighters. And when we get into, so should we say a flood or a fire instance, um, these are utilized to be able to pinpoint the location for evacuations. Um, we can use this as well as um, just creating a, um, uh, a radius around a certain point. Um, but again, the reason of showing this and the recognition that uh, many agencies across the county are utilizing this system to provide the, the um, residents and homeowners within these uh, districts uh, the ability to be able to get the information early enough um, that they are able to uh, pack up their necessities and, and uh, leave the site in a timely manner. And so with that, um, the disaster operation or disaster management in Boulder County. Uh, this is a website that there is uh, that's available that you can utilize to look up for more alerts and um, for any of these emergencies and severe weather in notifications that we were just discussing. And so if you feel as though you're not getting the information and you'd like to utilize this, um, we can, this will again be provided, I'm pretty sure, afterwards um, from this webinar, as well as uh, you can uh, just hit BOCO alert and as a Google search, and it will show to this website to where you can utilize it to, whoops, excuse me, you can utilize it to um, sign yourself up and sign anybody else up who feels they're not getting the information, um, pertinent information, I guess, about stuff that's happening in our area. So we had talked about the CWPP, um, thanks to Allison, and that was finished at the uh, end of December. And with that, we were able to provide a lot of guidance in the steps that our agency needed to make within the district. Um, some of the big changes have come to not specifically all the land management that's taking place at the moment, but the ability to build 
on a program uh, and develop something that uh, can provide a better service here into the community. And so uh, we've seen major changes within the department in personnel where we've actually added 18 new firefighters this year. We've also added three new BCs, two new fire operations specialists under the wildland uh, division to help with um, on call during high fire danger days and to help with critical decision making kind of in a timely manner. Um, we've also hired uh, six more community outreach individuals to help with incorporating and including the community with education and or um, knowledge, as well as um, we've gotten three new type six engines uh, that are now actually equipped and have been put out into their uh, individual stations and are in service. So last couple of years, Mountain View has really been helping with prescribed fire. We haven't been the forefront of the prescribed fire program. We had a program for a while where we uh, had a module, should we say, of six to eight people that we provided a mitigation service as well as uh, pile burning um, and chip days. But since the merge, um, we had to take a step back and revisit the program. And so with that being said, uh, we are trying to revisit uh, many of the, I guess, avenues of resources towards the community as possible and what are, are, are effective. Um, most of the projects that we'll be working through will be actually out in the flats in the plains, east in Boulder County. Um, and one of the things that we will be revisiting will be uh, the burning of ditches um, within the district uh, to minimize that fuel and potentially those wicks that have been discussed over uh, multiple uh, meetings that we've had. With that being said, um, a lot, 40% of actually Flagstaff uh, Mountain has actually been, has received mitigation efforts from our program in the past. Um, at the moment, our biggest thing is trying to work with homeowners um, to really to open up the access and egress to the residents and or other um, commercial buildings that we have in the district uh, so that our emergency apparatus can make access to these, these locations to, to help with the 911 response. Um, we Last year, we were able to burn the State Forest Service had a project that they had created over 650 piles on Flagstaff, and we were actually able to burn all 650 piles uh, this past winter, which was great. And with that, more or less, is our, our idea for the moment is that um, we're limited on personnel. And so our ability to provide a great opportunity to give the knowledge to the residents and the homeowners and provide options. So there are, uh, with wildfire partners, uh, there are mitigation contractors that are associated with their program that we utilize as well to alleviate the, um, the, the fuels that have been created from doing all the mitigation. And so now while we might not be able to physically be able to do the job, uh, we are attempting to provide many opportunities um, to alleviate that fuel and to mitigate and get rid of it. Um, up on the top right, you'll see we will be having a, a chip day where it'll be a fuel and material drop off um, at station nine uh, that we hope to continue that we've had in the past called Eldo Chip Day um, that we hope to continue to provide to the residents and move out from even just this community and uh, hit many of the others that haven't received this type of a resource in the past um, since they've been able to, by funding, provide this service. So again, we've done many uh, as, uh, opportunities with assistance on prescribed fire uh, with the feds. Um, federal system, as well as uh, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And at some point, um, hope to 
We've now have a program with the Niwot Sanitation District that we're going to start burning on their property and expanding from there, talking to all the open space uh, properties within our district and utilizing, utilizing our prescribed program um, and taking the steps to manage the land uh, effectively, should we say, with um, multiple um, opportunity, I guess, multiple times of um, being present on the on the landscape, and so this isn't just a one and done. Um, we want to make this a continuous effort so that we recognize the um, the change in the landscape to benefit um, living in a community, recognizing that firewise is the best, I guess, mindset, knowing that fire will be in the community, um, but how can we alleviate the threat to our our wants and our needs. So the county itself has a program that you can apply for a burn permit. And I wanted to hit on this a little bit so that uh, the opportunity and or the information is present and you may utilize it as you're uh, to moving forward with the alleviation of your fuels. And so, to get to the burn permit application, it is a free permit application. Um, it just takes approximately 15 minutes to fill out. And once you actually have your information in there, um, it will uh, autofill it at each time you update it. Um, these are uh, legit for one calendar year. So it goes from January 1 to December 31st. Then once you hit the next calendar year, you will have to reapply. Um, but the, the it is free again. Um, you can burn up to you can burn up to forty nine piles, or if you're going to do agricultural burning, you can do five to ten acres of um, forested uh, land uh, by following the guidelines within this uh, system. And so again, you can just Google or use your search engine and type in Boulder County burn permits. That will get you to this website where you'll find a lot of information pertaining to um, when I can, when I can't burn, what I can't burn, um, days where it's kind of what we call a red flag where high wind warning, um, days where we're not able to burn, um, and other information that can help facilitate uh, the safety of doing the, of alleviating the fuels on your property. So the other part though here is that um, within this website, there is this uh, open burn map, which is down here on the right. And so this map actually provides a um, accurate stamp of the individuals once they have uh, legitimately called into the county and said that they are burning. Um, this map updates and shows areas where the individual is burning. Now you can see, or it's really tough to see, should we say, but um, on the right side, it actually, or the left top side, it shows that um, there are five days out. So these are burns that is still, um, were conducted five days ago. Um, so the information is, is current and it's great to utilize so that you can uh, more or less keep in tuned if you feel as though the alerting system isn't giving you the information you're needing. So with that being said, um, here's our contact information. For media inquiries, please contact Rick Tillery, our public information officer. And for us, the Mountain View Department, uh, we are currently out at uh, 356 or 3561 Stagecoach Road in Longmont, but we will be moving to Niwot here soon with the, um, once we, um, I guess, get the final build on our new building. And so, um, with that being said, um, I appreciate the time and hopefully was able to provide uh, information about Mountain View and what our projects and plans are for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That was a great update. Um, I do see if you want to stop sharing your screen, you're good to go there. Um, I did see a question come in for you that's fairly specific. So I want to go ahead and take a quick minute to cover that. 
Um, Clay has written in the chat, is there a place we can see the evacuation polygons to understand, especially for Stone Canyon, X bar row, I mean, X bar seven, part of Southern Laramore County. The evacuations during the 37E and East Troublesome Cowwood Cameron Peak fires were challenging between Boulder and Larimer. Any comment on those or is that a shareable file or map that we can make available? So you can Google or use your search engine again and um, to look up, uh, what is it? Boulder County um, evacuation polygons um, or flood polygons and they will show you the, uh, I guess, size and or location of that polygon. Um, now, it does not give you specifics on use. Um, really what it is, is it's just a geographical location that's been set um, for the um, responding resources to make a request uh, through dispatch to uh, get the residents that are in that area uh, in, in kind of make it more of a specific area than um, um, a, a giant location. And so um, while you can see the actual polygon, there isn't going to be a lot of information that's attached to it. Uh, unmute myself. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, we can definitely share that link in a follow-up resource as well so that you can have a little bit better understanding. Um, but always uh, practice those and make a plan ahead of time. I was wondering, the next question, I was wondering if the open burn map shows agency burns in addition to private landowner burn permits. So it does not. It, it Only if the agency itself uh, would put the information on there. Um, and I, I will say sometimes it does, but it doesn't always provide that information. Um, not everybody is somewhat following that. Now, if you are a resident, it's a little bit um, more of a guide for that. Um, but again, it doesn't provide all of the information for every agency that is actually burning on here. Um, but it, it should keep it as, as most updated as possible. Um, so if what I will say is that if you feel as though you're not getting information or not seeing it and you want to find out, I'm pretty sure that if you come here, it should show it, but I can't guarantee that it will. Thank you, Paul. That was great info. Um, I think we can go ahead and move to Mike Smith with the U.S. Forest Service next. Um, yeah, take it away. Mike. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks so much, uh, BWC, um, for putting this together and the great presentations from both Paul and Allison. Great information. Um, again, my name is Mike Smith. I work for the U.S. Forest Service. I'm a zone prevention specialist, so really a lot of my job is working with the public and communicating what we're up to these days. Um, but I also get to wear a lot of different hats in the fire service. We, uh, the longer you do this, and sadly I've been doing this for a while, um, you, you get to play different roles. And today I'm going to be speaking from the burn perspective, burn boss perspective, and talking about some of the fuels treatments that we've done. Uh, so not only do I work on the, the prescribed side of things, I also work on the suppression side. And I'm uh, one of the incident commander trainees for Rocky Mountain Team 2, and I'm an ops chief for them as well. And I'm one of the incident commanders for the Boulder County Type 3 team. So I get to go and play on a lot of these things. And it, one of the great things about talking to you this evening is uh, I actually started my career with Cherry Vale Fire back in the day. So uh, a lot of history going back into that piece of dirt. So thanks for having me. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this all works. All right, Kat, am I showing? Good, thank you. Uh, of course, I started on the wrong slide. Why is it not working? If you, uh, click, if you click on that screen and then go back, it'll normally kind of find it. I was having trouble as well with the shared. Okay, I'm going to try this again. You know, we got in early and practiced this and nope, it's not working. I'm gonna stop sharing 
this is a feature, folks. Uh, you pay extra for this stuff. This is to get everybody's adrenaline pumping, get everybody ready. Everybody take your stretch break right now. All right, this is cool. Um, Mike, if you want to send them over, I can share as well. Yeah, my server won't send this big a file. Okay. So uh, I'm just trying one thing here. Okay, we're just going to punt on that and try again. Give me one second. Apparently, my PowerPoint is locked up. Okay, here we go again. All right, I think we're there. So yeah, again, I'm Mike Smith and thanks for having me. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk about landscape scale treatments. And so Paul talked a lot about the, suppre the suppression side of things and response side of things. And Allison talked a lot about the planning and prep that Superior is doing. And I'm gonna talk about the prescribed fire that we've been doing and uh, specifically the Foresight 2 project because it was so visible to Superior, Marshall, that area. Um, it certainly, um, add some complexity because we recognize what the community has been through with the previous fires. And uh, it's something that we're very sensitive to. So, um, you know, the map that Paul was showing with Boulder County Sheriff's and their open burn map, we have something on the forest called the prescribed fire map. And I'm almost afraid to try and do this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, this link will take you in and show you what's going on um, around the forest and you can zoom in and out on it and see uh, what's going on with the projects. I'm zoomed in currently on the Foresight 2 project and this is up by Gross Reservoir as many of you probably know. Um, but the cool thing about this is if you zoom out on this you can actually start to see all the different work that we're doing and how it's starting to come, come together. So one of the things that we've been working with for the past I mean, five or six years are what we call pod work or potential operational delineations. And those pods are, um, they look a lot like the evacuation of um, polygons that Paul showed, but they're basically places that in time of a fire that we can actually have pre-identified places to uh, take action on a fire. Not, it's not necessarily that we have to use it, but when a fire escapes initial attack and starts to go into that extended attack phase, we can utilize those pods. And currently what we're doing until we get all of the work done, because we've identified ridges, roads, rivers, riparian areas that are going to be good places for us to stop fire. But currently we're working on kind of the ribbon theory where we've done a lot of project work over the years, but uh, we wanna start tying them together. So one of the for, uh, focuses for the Foresight 2 project as we come in here, whoa, is that this is really um, kind of a multi-phase um, approach to what we're trying to protect. So not only are we trying to do some ecological good and restoring fire into the ecosystem, but with gross reservoir right there, we're also trying to protect the watershed. So in doing this work, um, you can see the two units, the, the top one um, and the lower one, that we uh, have had multiple entries on. And by entries, that means how many times we burned it. So when you go into um, a project, and we're going to talk more about this as we move forward, but um, you know, the first time you burn it, we call it first entry. And that generally, um, we're pretty timid about that. We try to burn it on the cooler end uh, so that uh, we can come back in subsequent times and try and eliminate more and more fuel. So there are some units that we've gone into three and four times to help uh, eliminate some of these fuels without killing the overstory um, and doing good work. So the anytime you wanna see what's going on on the forest, um, this is a really good place to go into. And you can see now um, this unit right here, 44 alpha, is what we burned most recently. And I was the burn boss on that. 
And then this is all unit 38 that we burned about three to four weeks prior to that. And we'll talk more about that as we go forward. Holy smokes, it's all working. Um, I'm gonna have to move the pictures here so I can see what's going on. So when we start to do this, we write what's called a burn plan. And that burn plan usually takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months to write. And when we're doing that, you know, we, the first thing we look at is what are our objectives? You know, wh how, what do we want our outcomes to look like? Um, and from that, then we start building into this, you know, these can be a hundred page documents. And within that, we start looking at what our restrictions are there ground bird nesting uh, times? Um, what are the owls in the area? You know, uh, is there snow? Is there not snow? And we can talk about that in prescriptions, but the weather conditions are really important. So we're looking at, and we do a lot of modeling to um, help us identify where we're gonna get the fire effects that we want. We also pre-identify all of the staffing. So how many engines and crews and hoses and pumps and tanks and all the things. And then acceptable outcomes. This is an interesting one because in some places, uh, we talk about mortality. So um, in this last unit, we were actually looking, I believe, at up to 20% um, mortality in the overstory. So mimicking fire. So if there was a lightning strike there in higher indices, what would that fire do? Um, so we try to mimic that. Then we go into smoke planning and permitting. Amber's here and she's gonna talk about that. She is amazing and knows way more than I can even try to talk to. We also go into contingency planning. So the what are we gonna do if it goes wrong? And a lot of prep work goes into uh, the contingency planning because really the whole goal of this thing after meeting the objectives really is, the, the big thing is to keep it in the box as we call it. The outreach plan is another big piece and, um, you know, burning in the front range, you know, especially where we were with this one, you know, looking right through the El Dorado notch, you know, we've got a couple of million people staring up at us and we're trying to minimize the impacts on our 911 system so that when somebody has an actual emergency that they can get a dispatcher and they can get the resources coming. So if we spend a lot of time, we've got a whole prevention program with um, a bunch of us that uh, really spend a lot of time doing public meetings, public tours, working with all of our dispatch agencies, um, newspaper, media, um, signage everywhere. We work with CDOT to get the variable message boards on the highway to show it. We really, one of our metrics for success is how many 911 calls come in during a burn. Um, then there's a, what we call the go, no go checklist. And that's what we do on the day of the burn. And that basically, when we do a what we call a test fire, we burn a small little patch um, on an edge of a unit that we can easily contain, and we see if we're getting the effects we want. Is it burning too hot? Shut it down. If it's not burning enough, we're going to shut it down. Um, so there's a lot that goes into that, and there's numerous people that actually sign off on that. So we'll burn a small parcel, we'll shut it down for a minute, and then we'll go through the go-no-go no go to make sure that we're meeting objectives. We've also got what's called the agency administration administrator um, authorization. And that's really where our rangers and line officers, we brief them on all the current fuel conditions, all the different things that we're looking at, um, all the things that are within the burn plan that we've done those things. And it's, uh, it's a hard sell pretty much every time because they're the one that's ultimately responsible um, above and beyond the burn boss. A couple of other things that are in there are prescriptions. Uh, for the Foresight 2 uh, burn, we actually had two different prescriptions that we were working with. One was what we called the snow prescription, where we were burning south aspects with um, a minimum of six inches of snow on all of the north aspects. So that gives us a big holding feature. Those south aspects, the snow peels off much quicker, the fuels dry out. And uh, that really helps us on some of that first and sometimes second entries to go in and really start to knock down some of the needles, um, the duff, the, the light fuels, the activity fuels, some people call them. And uh, that's about it. And I think I already talked about uh, first and ent second entry considerations, but that's really a big part of 
how we're going to do this. What do we want this to look like when we're done with this project? And then what are, what's maintenance going to look like in the long term? So that we're not just looking at what happens the day of, we're looking at second order effects and third order effects. So a big piece of what we look at, and I keep having to move my where everybody is so I can see what I'm looking at, <clears throat> is window and fuels conditions. Um, so when, when we start looking at when we're going to burn, we'll have the constraints within the burn plan, you know, and it's either going to be spring or fall. Um, a lot of the times we, the fall is a little bit spookier time to burn for us because the fuels are, have cured out from the summer and we got standing grasses and things. So the springtime is our preferred time to burn, but there are times that we do want to burn in the fall uh, to meet specific objectives. But uh, when we start, once we've got that burn plan written and we've start digging into seeing when it looks like we're going to get it, you know, we're out hiking these units. Uh, we select our burn boss, the person that's going to be in charge. That person is really spending a lot of time out there saying, okay, I'm going to want hose and pumps here and maybe some sprinklers here. Uh, we might want portable tanks of water. Where can we get engines? Where can't we? Um, and that's how we start to think about things. So, we, you know, we're looking at that two to three weeks out. We start to see things. We're talking to the weather service. They have what's called an incident meteorologist within the National Weather Service. And that's a person that really is producing the document, the, the product that you see um, on the top right of the screen that's helping us look at where we're at. And we give them all the parameters for our burn and then they color code it specifically to our burn plan. So uh, we'd love to see uh, days that are all green, but in reality, we don't get those. Um, that doesn't mean we can't burn, but that just means that we might need to bring in more resources, do some different things. But here you can see that, you know, we had a pretty good burn window um, with, you know, some little bit higher winds on that Friday the 3rd at 24 miles an hour. Uh, that 24 miles an hour was actually the very top end of our burn. So we actually did not burn that day, even though the plan said we could, we decided not to. Um, but as we get closer and closer, we start ordering resources. And by resources, again, engines, crews, modules, we order drones uh, for helping us with infrared uh, visibility from above, as well as for aerial ignitions. Um, and then as we get closer and closer, you can see there's a lot of work that goes into this. But at any given point, all the way up to the go, no go. Uh, Mother Nature can pull the rug out from underneath you. And it's one of the hardest things as a burn boss to contend with because there's a lot of what we call operational inertia. So there's a lot of time, you know, we've got people that are maybe coming from all over the country. Last year, we had hotshot crews coming from California. And uh, at one point, it really looked like we were not going to be able to burn. But fortunately, Mother Nature went, went ahead and helped us out. But there's a lot that goes into this. So we're constantly looking at fuels. We're uh, measuring the fuels conditions. Um, Paul talked a little bit about those thousand hour fuels. That's a dead fuel, it's three to 10 inches. Uh, we're also measuring live fuels. So clipping needles, seeing where we're at in stages of dormancy or not, and seeing how receptive um, things are. And we do that on almost a daily basis as we're leading up to a burn because it really can change when we started out on that previous burn, and I'll come back to the map in a second, but on unit 38, the Northern units, all of the juniper was not receptive to fire. And juniper is sort of the evil tree here because it's really volatile. And so we were, we were trying to get junipers to burn and we couldn't. Um, two weeks later, they were very receptive. So we had to spend a lot of time in making sure that as they burned, that they weren't putting embers outside the line. So that's about it on the weather and fuels. This is diving into, oh, and I put the wrong one up there. I put a pile burn prevention worksheet. Um, but uh, this is some of the things that we do. Again, media outlets, 911 centers, fire departments, making sure that our local, the fire districts that we're burning in, uh, we always try to invite our partners to come and burn with us. It's a great opportunity for them to not only do some, home, some good work on their home dirt, but we can provide some great training opportunities as well. We spend a lot of time working with our community connected partners like BWC. Um, they really help us get our message out and echoing some of that stuff. We'll go through and we've got a list of smoke sensitive individuals within each of our areas that we make sure that we contact multiple days in advance so that they know that we're going to be burning and what the potential is for smoke to impact them. 
Uh, again, highway signs, we put a lot of road signs out um, in places that we think that people will see them. We also do daily video briefings and we really talk about what we're doing leading up to and then how things are going on a daily basis. But the INSA website is a website maintained by the Forest Service, and that's really where you can get the best information. So I uh, strongly recommend that you do that. And for those of you that are interested in this stuff, we do have a constant contact email, and all you have to do is go to the Arapaho Roosevelt um, website and sign up for those. And you can just click the areas that you're interested in, and you'll get emails telling you about what project work's going on, what closures might be in place, and all the good work that's being done up on the forest. So I'm going to jump into an ops map here. I'm, we're probably not going to share this one with everybody because this is a pretty specific map and it's a ridiculous link. But I want to talk a little bit about how we burn. So this is the map that we give the firefighters on the day of the burn. And this one is um, a little out of date. So it's actually a little previous. So you can see the crosshatched areas on the northern side. Um, that's where we, when we started into 38, that's what had been burned the year before. Yeah, the year before and also back in 2000. Uh, so we started up in the yellow unit here, 38 Alpha West, did that one. And then we went down into, we reburned uh, the top half of Charlie. And then we went, that was second entry there. And the below the road here in Charlie, um, we burned that as a first entry. And that was, that, was, that one put up a, a fair amount of smoke, but we had a great transport day that day. So the winds, and the uh, atmosphere was really helping lift that smoke up and out. But the reason that we started up there was really the intent that it's moving further south into units 44, and that 44 is all of these units. So the reason we wanted to have all the units burned up on top first is that gives us a big catcher's mitt. So in case something unexpected were to happen, that we've got areas that are pre-burned to our north, and we've got a great big reservoir off to our east. So it gives us some really good catcher's mitts to work within. Um, on uh, 44 Alpha, uh, the way we burn these things, uh, you know, a lot of people wonder how we do these things. And so again, we had hose all the way around this thing. We had almost two and a half miles of hose on this uh, burn. And uh, with prevailing winds coming out of the west to the east, our big area of concern was basically from this knob up on top down to 16 and then down to 17. So we were worried about this northeast aspect. So we actually had sprinklers all the way down this out in the green so that where we didn't want fire, raising the relative humidity and decreasing the receptivity of fuels for fire embers that could come out of there. So that really helps us keep it in the box. But when we burn, we always try to start on a high point and we work our way down so we had the Wyoming Hotshots and the Beartooth Wild and Fire module here. And what we did was started burning about 100 feet deep from the top all the way down while another crew worked their way down around the, the other edge from 15 down to 18. And what that does is give us a big black edge to burn off of. And once we had finished that black lining, uh, then we were able to utilize our unmanned aerial systems or drones to do aerial ignitions. Uh, you can see how tight those lines are. That just shows how steep it is. And by using the UAS, what we can do is um, minimize the hazards for firefighters going in and out of there. And we can, with surgical precision, utilize that drone to start fire where we want and starting from the top, letting it burn into the black, starting from the, you know, taking a little bit further bite down and just taking a little strips until we get all the way down. As they get closer, then we carry fire carried fire from 17 to 18. And um, that that group met up with a group coming 15 to 18. And it really helps it all come together. A lot of people saw a fair amount of smoke that day. And I'm going to jump out of this map. And that's what it looked like on the day of ignition. So it was a fair amount of smoke. But when you're at a distance, you know, a lot of people... And for transparency, I will say that my house is just off the screen here. <laughs> so all of my neighbors were calling me going, oh my gosh, what's going on? And I would just show them a picture of what's at, what it looks like at the burn, because even though we're putting a fair amount of smoke in the area, and I understand that uh, generates a significant emotional response, but what we were seeing was that fire, the smoke was 
transporting off and lifting up and out. So um, we'd spend a lot of time looking at smoke monitors and Amber will talk more about that. But when you see that, you think that, you know, it's gonna look pretty significantly different on the ground, but this is what the fire looks like. And a lot of what we were trying to do is protect some of this beautiful open Ponderosa. So we'll actually go with a drip torch, which it has a, a mixture of gasoline and diesel and it drips fire and you can put fire around the base of trees and let it burn away so that we're not impacting the tree itself, but we're starting to consume all that needle duff that's accumulated over the years. And um, that's one of the, the things on a first entry burn is there's a lot, I mean, there are places that the needle duff was almost two feet deep. And that's one of the things that really can push up some smoke. But after the burn was done, this is what it looked like, what we call a perfect mosaic. So some of it's burned, some of it's not. We cleaned up the receptive fuels, but the stuff that didn't want to burn, didn't burn. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is mimic mother nature. And so we're pretty darn happy with how this burn came out. We're hoping to do a field trip here in the next month or so to take people out so they can see it in person. But this was uh, you know, a, a big step forward for us to get these two units, um, or actually three units done this uh, spring and really get our prescribed fire program going up, like was alluded to earlier. Um, you know, we can do a lot of fuels work. We can do a lot of piling and thinning, which we do a lot of the times, especially on different aspects. If we're going into North aspects, it's too overgrown from years of fire suppression. So the work that goes into this hopefully leads us to these sort of outcomes where we're really reducing the receptivity of fire and fuels. So the last piece of this is the securing part. So once we're done and you know that we there's not as much smoke coming up and everybody stops paying attention, oh, it's done. Um, but that's really when the hard work begins is how do we keep this thing over time? And it's not just a one or two day thing. So as again, as soon as we're, ignitions have begun, there's two groups that are working on the fire. There's a group called firing. They're the people actually putting on the fire on the ground but they're working in direct coordination with the, the holding group. And the holding group is usually about seven to 10 times larger than the firing group. And what they're doing is basically dictating to the firing group how quickly that or slowly they need to move to make sure that the fire isn't doing anything that we don't want to as far as moving outside of the prescribed fire unit. So once we've got, you know, we generally try to secure, you know, 30 to 60 feet on that first night. Um, but we staff the fire 24 seven, generally three to seven days afterwards, depending on if we get rain or snow, uh, when they burned the first units on the north side, um, both of the units they burned on separate days, they got snow following it up. I was pretty jealous as the burn boss. That's like the greatest day ever. Um, for me on 44, we actually didn't get, um, the 0.25 inches of rain that we need to call it out until yesterday. And we burned this over a month ago. So, but again, we continue to staff it overnight and then it goes into a monitor status where we're coming out and checking it daily. But if we see incoming winds or lower relative humidities, we might up staff, but we basically don't walk away from it until we know that we have not seen any heat or smoke and we will fly it with the drones with an infrared camera multiple times, making sure that there's nothing hiding in there. And it's a long waiting game. It's a lot of hiking. You know, it's about a thousand feet, a little bit less from bottom to top. And I can't tell you how many times I've walked that unit, but, but we spend a lot of time making sure that we secure it. And that's how we sort of wrap that project up. And once it's called out, then we as the burn bosses and the agency administrators uh, feel very comfortable that we have completed all of the due diligence to keep the fire in the box and help continue to improve our forest health and do the good the work that good fire does, which will help us prevent bad fires. So with that, that finishes my presentation. I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions and I really appreciate y'all letting me speak with you. And I'll Thanks. stop sharing. Thank you so much, Mike such a wealth of information in that presentation. One question that I want to get to very quickly before we just shift over to Amber is, Mike, can you please uh, relate contained controlled terms to your securing and monitoring slide, please? Thanks for 
Sure. Right so uh, sometimes we get mixed metaphors in the in, in our world. And um, in the suppression world, contained, controlled, and out is how we describe a, a, a wildfire. So contained means that we have containment line around the perimeter of the fire. Uh, controlled means that there is no visible heat or smoke. Out means it's been at least 24 hours, generally 48 hours of multiple firefight, multiple visits from multiple firefighters calling that out. For us on the prescribed fire side of things, containment really comes down to we already have all of the lines that we need prior to the event. So if we needed hand lines, we put those lines in, or we might just put sprinklers um, on unit 44, we actually had a big rock cliff across about two thirds of the top of it. So we didn't need to put any line in, but we did have some hoses on the back side of that cliff in case an ember came up and over, but it was about an 80 foot high cliff. So we were pretty confident and actually nothing came to fruition from that. So, uh, we don't really, we don't use controlled and we don't use the term controlled, um, on the prescribed fire side of things. Um, but the out terminology means again, that we've uh, revisited it a number of times and we've met the prescription parameters, um, which is generally um, 100 feet of absolute cold on the, or I'm sorry, out is, contained is 100 feet on the edge, a uh, quarter inch of moisture um, and numerous um, examinations under infrared and uh, by hand. Thank you very much, Clay. Feel free to follow up if you have any questions, but I might hold those for post-event um, communications because I do want to make sure that we get Amber up here. Steve Orr has a really rich question in chat. I also, if Mike thinks you can do a quick answer on it, let's try it. And if not, it does seem like it's, it's a hefty question. So the question is, what do you perceive are the true barriers to prescribed fire in the city of Boulder? And just an easy question, softball question. What do you believe are some solutions? Uh, let's just preface this with, that I know Steve and Steve works for Boulder Fire. So thanks, buddy. Um, <laughs> so uh, the challenges are always, you know, uh, finding the right time. It's a difficult place for us to burn due to our atmospheric conditions. We get a lot of wind. We're in a, what's called a class one air shed. So we have a lot of constraints placed upon us. And we're in a, a, an emotionally delicate um, public. Um, so we, we have an emotionally delicate public that, that's been through a lot between Marshall and Calwood and Left Hand and the myriad of fires we've had over the years. Um, it's very hard to get people to understand that this needs to be done. Um, solutions, Steve, I'll buy you a beer sometime. We'll figure it out. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, not to take Kieran's job, but let's hand it over to Amber. I'm excited to hear uh, all, all the, so so for zooming out on the landscape, imagine Amber's floating up in the sky, I guess, is where, is where she's going to come in here. So hand it over to Amber. Sorry, Amber, I just, yeah, you should be back in. There we go. I must forgot. Ooh, and can you see my slides? We've got slides and we've got audio. Go for it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I'm Dr. Amber Ortega. I am the Regional Smoke Coordinator for the Forest Service. Um, I'm the Regional Smoke Coordinator for the entire Region 2 that we call it of the Forest Service, which is the Rocky Mountain region, which includes Wyoming, Colorado, North excuse me, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas. And I'm also detailed in as the Pacific Northwest and Alaska Regional Smoke Coordinator. So that's Oregon, Washington, and Washington. And I joke uh, a little bit and say, if it's on fire on Forest Service land in any of those eight states, I'm the smoke wrangler, or somehow uh, I speak for the smoke in those areas. One of my opening slides I always do is that relatively few people will lose their homes to a fire but everyone is affected by the smoke. All of us will breathe in wildfire smoke at some point in the next year and in the last year, and that the air knows no land management boundaries. Smoke unifies us all. And just so you guys know a little bit about my background, I grew up near the Appalachian Trail in Pennsylvania. I moved to Boulder, Colorado in 2008 for my graduate degree. 
And I've lived in Colorado ever since. And actually one of the homes that I personally lived in during the end of grad school um, was lost to the Marshall Fire. So I know that in this community, there's more than a few people who've lost their homes to fire. And when we see smoke in the air, that can affect all of us. Something that I wanna point out in this image here, this is from a wildfire in on the Salmon Chalice in Idaho. And it's um, you know one of those beautiful sunsets. This was a wildfire in the wilderness. It was not threatening any homes. And you can see that I took this photo myself from the district office of the Forest Service. And I was breathing in really good air. Um, there's blue skies around me and I can see that smoke plume. So that means I'm not actually breathing in smoke, but I'm cer certainly emotionally impacted by the smoke. I also wanna point out if you can use your mind in that Google Earth 3D zoom out way, that if you imagine that you're a satellite in space looking down on the smoke plume, it looks like there's a lot of smoke. And yet under the ground you can see or on the ground, you can see where we were driving this road that went through this community, there was not a lot of smoke on the roadway, even though from space, it looked like there should be. So I wanna point that out in terms of perspectives and how we look at smoke, that we're very, very impacted visually by smoke, but there may not be metrics to look at that from a satellite or from ground-based smoke monitoring. We'll get into all of that right now. Another thing I like to, start with is these are oil paintings from the 1800s in the Nebraska Territory, so arguably what could be so-called Colorado in the 1800s. And this was a, George Catlin was a scholar and sculptor and painter that went out with a lot of trappers and traders, and he painted scenes of wildfires. His journal talks about how devastating they were to the animals, to the Native American communities, to the settlers. And he also talked about how devastatingly beautiful they were, how they were some of the most beautiful things he'd ever seen. Since we only have satellite data around wildfires since the 1970s or so, we only have smoke monitoring data since about the 1990s. In fact, the Clean Air Act of 1990 was the one that set in um, ambient air quality regulations for things like smoke. We don't have the ability to do tree for sampling and look at tree rings or do ice cores or ocean cores the way we do with some of the other climate relevant parameters. One of the things we use to look at smoke and air quality is paintings. Oil paintings almost never dry. And so the way that the pigment ages between the different colors tells us something about the atmospheric chemistry where those paintings are from. So I just wanted to throw that out there that smoke is so visually compelling that it inspires artists and that if you do an analysis of the content of these paintings, over 70, 80% is smoke, it's not flame. So I use this image to convey the fact that we as humans are a fire adapted species and that almost every lineage out there has a story where fire was a gift as a tool to humanity from some type of divinity. And the use of fire as a tool sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. I know birds of prey have been known to spread uh, wildfires in order to drive out um, prey. Um, but in terms of the ability to control or use fire for our own benefit is something unique to humans. And since when we're looking out in the landscape, we're gonna see smoke before we see flames, it's inherent to the human condition that seeing smoke brings up feelings for us. And that could be, if you're from the fire community, a feeling of almost um, adrenaline or excitement. What's going on? Is somebody burning? Is there a wildfire? Am I gonna get dispatched? Am I gonna get overtime? And for our kiddos or our spouses, that could be a very different feeling based on how they've related to us and to fire. You know, is my loved one coming home tonight? Are they gonna be out all night responding to an initial attack call? And to the public, um, most of us in the West, you could say that we have some type of complex PTSD from being smoke and wildfire communities. We are used to, um, oh, you know, something's gone fire out there. What's going to happen? What's going on? Or big Canadian wildfire smoke days or smoke transported from areas like Montana when we don't even have wildfires in Colorado. So we have our own set of feelings that come up when we see smoke. And we're not gonna be able to talk ourselves necessarily out of those feelings because they're part of being human. They're part of living on earth. And these areas are fire adapted communities in, sense, in the sense of the forests had their own fire resiliency built over time and their own natural fire cadence 
And when we come in and we have feelings about fire, we're in that same ecosystem and that same environment. So I just want to put that out there, that smoke will bring up feelings and that's okay. Oh, we skipped. Um, so one of the things when we talk about smoke, a lot of folks ask, why can't we just thin the forest instead? Can't we do other things instead of put smoke in the air? We already get smoke from wildfires. Why do we have to put more smoke in for prescribed fires? And here we talk about how fire is a part of the forest regenerating itself. And when we have no tolerance for fire or smoke outside of that, we prevent the forest from actually doing its own thing and regenerating. We know there's certain types of pine cones that won't release their seeds until they are hot enough to open up. We also know that there's certain types of seeds that are dependent upon smoke to start the DNA activation process of germinating. And denying those seeds that smoke may actually hurt the forest ability to regenerate itself. In addition, Native Americans have been using fire as a tool for millennia and in touch with the systems and cycles of fire on the landscape and also how wildlife can respond in positive ways to that fire on the landscape. Here's some examples of um, the bootleg fire in, in California and the interaction between doing prescribed fire and not doing prescribed fire. In these images, there are two different views of the same um, interaction. We have no treatment where there was no prescribed fire. We have um, thinning only means thinning and then pile burning. And then thinning plus prescribed fire means they did the thinning and pile burning. And then they did the broadcast burning where fire was allowed to propagate on the landscape in uh, low, medium, and mixed severity. And you can see that our best fighting chance at slowing down uh, wildfire and then also creating fire resilient forests that can survive through a wildfire is doing broadcast burning and prescribed fire. This is the Cameron Peak fire. This, the red is the final burn footprint. The light blue are prescribed fire broadcast burn projects and the uh, dark blue is a wildfire. And when we talk about smoke from these different instances, the prescribed fires in this image cause no notices of air quality violation. Local communities right in the immediate vicinity likely had a night of smelling smoke and needed to take some risk mitigating actions. But other than that, there were no large scale smoke impacts. However, the Cameron Peak fire itself caused almost a month of air quality violations. So when I look at this, the conversation becomes consent and risk. Do we consent to having some smoke overnight in order to mitigate our risk of fire moving into our communities like it did here, causing evacuations near a horse tooth reservoir and in Loveland? Or do we not consent to any smoke at all? And then therefore asking land managers to do no prescribed fire, to do no protective actions pre-season in order to protect our communities. That's a conversation we have to have as a group, but we can't look at just smoke or just air quality or just health as a silo and separate from forest health and the ability to protect our communities the best we can from catastrophic wildfire. I believe Mike showed something similar to this, but we all live in what is called the Colorado Front Range Priority Landscape of the Forest Service, and that connects multiple communities, jurisdictions from the Wyoming border south past Colorado Springs. And the goal is to create a checkerboard pattern, a ribbon north to south to prevent wildfire that may break out on the continental divide from being wind driven and propagating into our city limits. We do smoke management and we work directly with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to get smoke permits. When I talk about smoke management, I talk about the weather conditions, which Mike talked about, the time of the day, what time we start ignition, mop up, um, making sure things are cold before they, we call it out, fuels, which means vegetation, what on the landscape are we targeting for vegetation, how long are we burning, how big are we burning today, how many acres, um, where we are burning, where, what drainage or what um, reservoir or creek system that smoke will drain in at night. Smoke acts just like water. It's like pouring a cup of water out onto the landscape. So what geographical areas will be most impacted by that smoke? Um, different firing techniques are the way we ignite 
can change how that smoke propagates. And then what's in smoke, the different constituents of smoke, how much smoke is put out in flaming versus smoldering types of uh, ignition or fire phases. These are things we talk about when we do smoke management. And that's something that we have to do as part of large burners in Colorado. Mike showed um, one of these weather matrices. And this is a combination where the incident meteorologist takes the burn plan and creates a color-coded forecast where we look at conditions that are good for burning, green, um, on the edge, marginal, or unfavorable. And one of those aspects is the smoke part of it, the dispersion, peak smoke dispersion here. And based on those different adjective categories, we're allowed to burn different acres in order to only put out as much smoke emissions as that mixing or dispersion of the atmosphere can handle. I also put in here um, an image of what a forest would look like pre-burning, during burning, and then a year after. And you can see that regenerative property. Wildlife loves areas um, after regeneration, after a low severity, mixed severity fire, because it opens up areas the pioneer species, the first plants that grow after fire are the most uh, attractive for a lot of wildlife. Most folks know if you have an elk permit, you would, uh, for hunting, you would wanna go to a place that's recently had fire. Um, so the forest itself can be starved for fire and providing fire in a way that doesn't cause catastrophic scorched earth type um, nothing left on the landscape. Wildfire is a great way to regenerate the forest and recreate in these areas that we love. So I wanted to show this example of um, uh, prescribed fire. Now this is a bit south of us. Hopefully you guys recognize the satellite map. There's Denver in the center. Boulder is up here as one of the spokes on the large Denver wheel. And there's a prescribed fire uh, right here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, but maybe you can't, but there's a prescribed fire um, out here uh, near Bailey off 285. And it is producing a smoke plume that kind of blends in with the clouds, but you can see the smoke plume. So imagine where you are in Denver and what you might be seeing in the sky while you're uh, out on a Sunday or a Saturday, looking up and seeing smoke in the distance. If you're in a community along 285 or hiking down there, you might be really concerned because that smoke looks a lot closer. And then you might pull up what we call the fire and smoke map on your phone, which is um, an AirNow app for fire.airnow.gov. And you'll see something like this. And this map combines what the satellite saw as a smoke plume. It draws that on as polygons here. And then it combines that with the smoke sensors and smoke monitors that are on the ground. Green means good air quality. And you can see that this is a very confusing picture. I actually got this as a text message screenshot from some very high ups in the Forest Service who live nearby wondering what's going on? Why isn't this map showing smoke? This is the example, like I showed you with a wildfire earlier, where we have the bottom up. We're looking at smoke sensors where we breeze. We're not having smoke hit the ground. And then we're looking at the satellite top down where we're seeing smoke in the atmosphere. So we can see smoke visually and we can not be breathing it in. And depending on our relationship to smoke, it can cause physiological impacts if we, if that brings us stress and anxiety or reminds us of other situations where we did breathe it out. And then here is a image um, from a watch out cam looking at that exact prescribed fire at that same time. So you can see that it is producing a visible smoke plume. It does have one small heat detect on the satellite and that smoke is dispersing to the east um, and going over uh, the terrain there, which is causing additional mixing. So by the time it makes it over that, you're not actually getting any of that smoke hitting the ground at measurable levels. I call this environmental psychology because we can see smoke and think, oh man, I'm breathing in smoke, but then we're not actually breathing in smoke at the ground level. Hold on, I forgot to turn on my, uh, plug in my computer and I just got a warning. Luckily, I got it ready. And now we have power. Okay. So what do we do? Um, well, we can become smoke ready. And I use smoke ready as a term to define preparing the public to receive smoke in ways that allow us to mitigate our risk. Um, this one image here is um, on what we call a sandwich board, where we had a public information officer stationed near that same prescribed fire I just showed. 
Um, they had materials out about the air quality index, um, how to create a clean air shelter in your own house using simple objects that you may already have around, and then a QR code to look at the air quality real-time data where you are right now. What is PM 2.5? If you've been interested in smoke for a little while, you may know what this term means. When I talk about smoke and smoke monitors, what those smoke monitors are measuring is what's called PM 2.5. That is particulate matter that's less than 2.5 microns in diameter. This image here is an electron scanning microscope image of some familiar objects, potentially. The uh, one that I have, what is PM 2.5 over, is actually PM 10. So that's particulate matter under 10 microns. Uh, this would be something like dust, ash that falls out during wildfires, um, things of that nature. They're a little bit bigger in diameter and when we read them in, they get caught in our upper respiratory system and we blow them out of our nose. And if you've been around a campfire and you've been the one that gets the smoke in your face, you're pretty familiar with PM10. Then I have a red blood cell, mostly to show you how small PM2.5 is. So PM 2.5 is in the smoke column that comes off of a campfire or uh, burning the bacon on your stove or uh, a prescribed fire. And that PM 2.5 is particulate matter smaller than 2.5 microns. And it's small enough to get not only into your lungs deep in them, but then cross into your bloodstream. So it can cause respiratory and cardiovascular issues. It's also very small, so it doesn't fall out the way that ash would fall out. So it can travel for very, very long distances. That's why we're impacted by things like Canadian wildfires. We use the air quality index to talk about this. So you guys don't have to worry about microns and micrograms per meter cubed or particulates smaller than 2.5 nanometers. Um, and we use this air quality scale to do a color code. Green is good, yellow is moderate, orange is unhealthy for sensitive groups and so on and so forth. I have some what should you do actions here depending on your health risk, whether you have asthma, people with heart disease, lung disease, et cetera. And then when you get on what we're calling the fire and smoke map and you look at the data, you would see something like the image I have um, with the time periods each day from a prescribed fire. You can see that on April 16th and then April 17th, there was a prescribed fire on April 16th. During the day that smoke did not hit the ground, but at night, this monitor was in a drainage where smoke rolled downhill at night, and they did wake up to the smell of smoke overnight, and there was a peak into the unhealthy for one hour. Uh, actually, it's a now cast, so that's not exactly one hour, but they did have a peak overnight, um, but that smoke ended up clearing out in the morning when the daytime mixing started up. So the 24-hour average of the air quality index was good to moderate each day during and after the burn. The reason this is important is because it's almost like sound. You can have your ears blown out from a rock concert being really, really loud, or you can have low level hearing damage from not quite loud sound consistently. We talk about that in terms of the cumulative effects. Particulate matter or smoke is has cumulative effects. So if you have a bit of smoke and then you get into clean air, your body has the ability to clean itself out and for you to not have health effects at the level you would if you had moderate levels or orange levels of smoke for a prolonged period of time. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's all about the cumulative effects over the course of a day, over a course of a summer, or over a course of a lifetime. This is the fire and smoke map or fire.airnow.gov, and I recommend this is your one-stop shop. We have it in Spanish and English. I have the Spanish version shown here. This is during fire season, and when you have a wildfire that's big enough to order an air resource advisor, which I'm one of, we are smoke specialists that get dispatched to help incident command teams on wildfires, you'll have a blue box around your area. And if you click on that blue box, you'll get a smoke outlook. If you click on any one monitor, you see here I have one in Boulder brought up, even though I don't have that zoom here. Um, that'll bring up your PM 2.5 now cast air quality data, which is our proxy or metric for looking at smoke. So sensitive groups, people who are sensitive to wildfire smoke may not be listed here. It's not something you can see or tell from a necessary diagnosis. Some people are just much more sensitive to smoke than others. But folks we know that already are 
sensitive to smoke would be folks with heart or lung disease, people with high exposure, like me as somebody who works in fire, uh, or outdoor workers, people who work in conditions where they're going to be exposed to environmental irritants and hazards. Um, if you've had heart, uh, heart attack or a stroke, infants, children, pregnant women, and elderly. Those are folks who would be considered um, in that sensitive groups. So when it gets to that orange level and it's unhealthy for sensitive groups, they should take some risk mitigating actions. And we have a website by Fire Adapted Colorado called the Smoke Ready website. There's a flyer on there about prescribed fire smoke. There's lots of information on there. Um, but here's some things that you can do. You can limit your outdoor activities when smoke is in the air. If it's very, very smoky and you have to go outside, you can wear a mask. You can filter the air inside your home or workplace using a HEPA filter, or you can make your own do with a do-it-yourself box fan version. And on smoky days, limiting outside activity, um, having an action plan so that kiddos can do outdoor research recess inside instead. Um, during wildfires or on large prescribed fires, you may get an air resource advisor like myself. Here I am on one in Idaho. Um, we do Facebook briefings um, or TV briefings. We put out um, air quality monitors. This is a large smoke monitor out here. And then we can help um, create clean air shelters. So here's an example of a low cost sensor, which is in the small PVC cap um, that's outside. And then we have a low cost sensor inside that glows with the color of the air quality index. And then in this yurt, which you can tell by the background in the air monitoring and progress photo, that's basically a tent. It's not an airtight shelter. And this was an image from fire camp where we were breathing a lot of smoke. And we ended up getting box fans and HVAC filters and created a clean air shelter inside of these yurts. So these box fans are really, really effective. They're pretty affordable. Some of that material you may already have inside your house. And it's a good way to mitigate your exposure to smoke. You can use it if somebody burns the bacon or if your neighbor burns trash or you have Canadian wildfire smoke or you have a prescribed fire from nearby. It doesn't necessarily matter your smoke source, the way that you mitigate your risk or decrease your exposure is the same. And we are able to keep the air green in yurts, which are tents and not airtight with these box fans, even when we're experiencing in the hundreds or deep red air quality index. And that's all I have everyone. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you, Amber. That was Awesome. Always, always also a wealth of information in that. So we'll be sure to share the resources that she shared, the links, some of those um, do it yourself, but also purchasable items. Um, we did have one conversation starter that I'll let anybody kind of jump in on. The general question for discussion is, how do you organize controlled burns in areas with complex land ownership patterns slash multi multi-jurisdictional combined with private lands. That seems to me to be one of the biggest challenges in the urban wildland interface. I guess Anyone? I can jump on that one. Um, so there's a couple pieces to this. So and until recently, federal land management agencies weren't able to do prescribed fire on private lands. Uh, there was uh, a bill passed through Congress called the Widen uh, I think it's the Widen Amendment or Widen Agreement that uh, does allow some burning to be done by federal agencies on private land, but it's extremely complicated to do. So it's one of the things that we're um, actually looking at trying to figure out how we can do that and start doing cross-jurisdictional burning. I think it's important that we do that. One of the things that we do is work with all of our um, partners on their CWPPs. I think I'm part of I'm on a core team, I think for seven different CWPPs right now, and really trying to help them identify places on private lands where they can help connect the dots to some of the federal land management treatments. So how do we organize it? Um, you know, one of the things is part of the burn plan is called the complexity analysis. And part of that is uh, when we go through and look at all of the different things that we need to do. Um, we rate it out through this spreadsheet and it'll come back as either low, moderate or high complexity. And that dictates the level of um, training, 
sorry, I'm getting a phone call. I'm trying, they're trying to order me to that fire up in Leadville. Call you right back. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, so once for most of the burns that we do around here, they end up being moderate complexity, um, but they're on the high end of moderate complexity. Generally, when we get into high, high complexity burns, you know, you're getting into the thousands of acres, maybe multiple aircraft doing aerial ignition. And so that's how we manage those things. But the cross jurisdictional burning is difficult, but it's something we are working towards. And that's a shared objective as, as some of our uh, local organizations, such as the Boulder Watershed Collective as well, and working with other local agencies and governmentals is trying to connect where their ribbon is and, and get that work to, to touch each other or a butt. So it's definitely a collaborative process and um, definitely one still in progress. So let's continue that conversation, Marcus and Elizabeth. Um, all right, I see that Amber addressed one more question. We are definitely running over. We've got one more comment if everybody has the time. Mike, if you need to hop off and head to Leadville, please do. Uh, we appreciate your support and your efforts there. Uh, the comment that we will wrap our evening up with is, as a marginally large landowner, after having seen wildfires affect even in a thin forest, I'd love any assistance for prescribed burns, I'm assuming on private land, liability seems too large to contemplate orchestrating as a private non-industrial owner. Um, I think that's a, a pretty wide shared sentiment for a lot of people in this area, Clay, and um, we would um, definitely, again, continue that conversation with you um, in other times, but it's I, I'm excited to see that you would like to do that. So thank you for being here. Um, thanks everyone for being here. This was a really rich program. I really appreciate everyone's time, especially your extra time. Thank you, Allison, Paul, Mike, Amber, everybody. We will be sending a wealth of resources out in our post-event communications. So keep an eye out there. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach back out. Um, we will be sharing everyone's um, we, we can connect to share everyone's information if that works for everybody. And um, thanks, everybody. What a wonderful summer kickoff. Mike, take care if you head to Leadville and, and everybody else. Take care of yourself and each other. And I'll just add really quick, in addition to the info in our follow-up email, we'll also be um, sharing info about potentially making this a bit of a series. Um, with this webinar being the first. So we're gonna um, talk about maybe planning um, a potential field trip um, and a forest bathing sort of um, event to follow up on the same themes that we've been sort of exploring here in this webinar. So keep an eye out for that as well. Yes, thank you, Karen. All right, with that, everyone enjoy your evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank yous all around and goodbye. Bye.